we're going to conclude with, with a remarkable individual. Um, anyone that lives in the, uh, the true world of design knows Scott Wilson. Uh, he's the founder and the chief uh, creative officer of a wonderful organization here in town called Minimal. Uh, they were founded in uh, 1997. Uh, he is an absolutely a designer's a designer. Um, he uh, had been the, uh, prior to starting Minimal, he was the uh, former global creative director at Nike. Then he had a leadership position uh, at uh, Wilson and the Thompson Consumer Products, um, IDO, Fortune Brands, uh, and Motorola. Uh, multiple, multiple award-winning designer, uh, remarkable designer, remarkable organization. Welcome, Scott. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Not that I don't trust you, but I'm going to use my own computer. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Um, it's always good to talk to the home, home uh, town. Um, let's see here, I'm gonna push play so you don't have to look at all that. And repetitive. So, as Walter said, I started Minimal like uh, seven years ago after uh, quite a while bouncing around every uh, so often. In the 90s, I was bouncing jobs every year and a half. Uh, unfortunately, Craig, had me twice, uh, <laughs> and uh, but that seems pretty normal today, I guess. But uh, everybody warned me about burning bridges. But uh, you know, it was interesting. My father, um, my my guidance counselor wanted me to be an engineer. My uh, art teacher wanted me to be an illustrator, and my dad wanted me to be a baseball player. And it's interesting how all those things kind of definitely influence you later on in life, even to the point where. Uh, you know, baseball being a pitcher and being a one-on-one -on -one kind of strategy, keeping the batter, uh, the competition off balance, but at the same time you're part of a team, definitely translates later on in life. Um, so I guess that's how I kind of end up here. I, I have a little bit of a um, bouncing around presentation that's kind of over 10 years of going from entrepreneur to entrepreneur. And um, you know, we'll go through this. Hopefully it doesn't go over, but she'll cut me off, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, I, I just, it's a great panel of speakers here. And, you know, Chris, uh, man, you give me hope. Because <laughs> as a business owner, the financial dashboard that I want, I hope is right around the corner. Because I, as Gina can attest, I've lived the last eight months just looking at financial uh, performance and cash flow analysis. And I'm like, you know, it's hard when you're a multi-business owner and you're trying to make these decisions every day and you don't have the transparency or the insight that you need. So that's where I love design thinking, and whether it's, you know, Quill or Uber or whatever it is, is like connecting the dots, which is kind of what I love to do now. Uh, Minimal's kind of evolved into like a, a 360 degree product design and development firm, and we also do our own brand incubation. Um, we do we work across a lot of different industries, as you can see here, from uh, you know furniture and consumer products and uh, and uh, medical, and uh, so it's quite a range. A boat over there uh, that's a pipe dream right now but I'm um, working on it we recently moved to uh, from 30 people in a 2,000 square foot space to 15,000 square feet um, over uh, not too far from the new Google building um, in Fulton Market um, it's three bow trust buildings um, we've built out two of them um, there's a studio we have a kind of a uh, cafe area that we uh, activate different things for product launches or um, like Code Academy or different classes uh, that can come in and do uh, use the cafe. Um, we have a lot of fun as well. This was actually a uh, Kickstarter All-Star Gallery where we took the, our favorite Kickstarter projects that actually funded and shipped, which is important, and we put them all in this room, small little room, and we had $26 million worth of raised funds in that room in August, uh, which is pretty impressive, and especially since all those ideas probably would never seen the light of day without crowdfunding. Um, we've got a big garage space that we're not sure what we're going to do with it. Right now we're parking, especially this winter. But, you know, we'll, we'll look at doing uh, kind of a, a flow of events and uh, creative things coming through there to kind of like both, you know, expose us to it, but also, uh, you know, hopefully connect the community in that area. Um, my you know, background is like three consultancies, four corporations, um, used to be five startups, now I've got two more kind of on the verge of starting and one marriage, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I think, you know, I think she's with me on the next one, but we'll see. Um, and I had a, an amazing foundation, um, you know, audio. I came up here in 95. Craig uh, saw something, I guess, in me and, uh, you know, allowed me and uh, another guy, Doug Satsker, to kind of help uh, get the design group off the ground. And it was an incredible learning for me because I was kind of just an instinctual designer and, you know, the multidisciplinary, and John Lank, too, is with me. Um, uh, the multidisciplinary aspect of design, plus being in Chicago with IIT and user-centered design, and I think you know you guys were kind of starting it out here. I mean, uh, unfortunately, like I, you know, wish I would have had access to this kind of program when I was coming out of school. Um, but it really rounded me out and great, created a great foundation. Whereas Nike really kind of shut, uh, showed me how to go A to Z uh, from a big brand, from all the way from product research all the way to you know launch events. And, um, and how the big brand operated. And Motorola was, you know, a way to come back to Chicago and uh, get back into tech. And, uh, you know, it was a, I think I probably should have went Motorola to Nike instead of vice versa, but, you know, and it was before Android. I didn't know Android was coming, and, you know, it's, Motorola's changed a lot. And I was just there at a different time when I was probably a cultural misfit, but um, I learned a lot. Sometimes these challenges in your career, you learn the most that benefit you later. And, um, so amazing companies that I've worked with. And you know, when I started Minimal, I tried to create the best of all worlds. I wanted to do the fee-based consulting for the variety. I wanted to do the long-term partnerships and taking some risk and, uh, with some of the upside and these long-term kind of uh, long um, processes to get to market. Um, that's everybody from Steelcase on down to like startups to brand incubation where it's just our pure vision uh, going to market. Um, and uh, you know, so a decade of in, uh, incubation uh, from 2004 to 2014. Um, founded Uba, which was a baby furniture company that was inspired by the birth of my first daughter in 2004. Then I licensed it off when I started Minimal and, um, and left Motorola and found, uh, founded Minimal, so, which was self-funded. I founded Uncommon, which is a customization thing inspired by Nike ID when I, I spent about three years working on Nike ID when I was at Nike. Um, you know, raised some money, uh, unfortunately had a bad partnership and was forced to sell my stake in the company a little earlier than I would have liked to, but uh, bounced back and uh, um, kick-started, uh, tried this thing called Kickstarter, and, you know, um, kick-started three different projects. Uh, we're currently developing another collaborative app on the iPad, which Apple's very excited about, and I'm looking at scaling Lunatic, um, which is uh, what came out of the first Kickstarter. And I think there's this really hard to read uh, thing down here, but uh, you know, it's a long journey to instant success. There's this notion of instant success today that's kind of growing because of all the WhatsApp and you know, all these different uh, things that are huge uh, buyouts and um, acquisitions. And it's like, yes, it can happen, but typically it's a long, hard road with a lot of uh, resets along the way and uh, a lot of pain but you know it's your pain and <laughs> I think it's a uh, kind of um, yeah I wouldn't trade it for anything the uh, you know what are the things that I think are important obviously we all know the curiosity and focus are really kind of important for innovation and uh, entrepreneurs or you can call it ADD and OCD um, <laughs> I definitely have both uh, there's good acronyms for that but you know I think courage is you know what separates entrepreneurs from dreamers and um, I guess I'm, I got some, <laughs> what do you want to call it? I, I've got, you know, partially, I'm partially insane, partially, uh, I guess, brave. And, um, you know, some of the risks I take are probably abnormally, uh, abnormal for a designer, I think. Um, but I wanted to start off with uh, corporate entrepreneurship, which is, you know, I didn't even know, you know, never even thought of it when I started at um, uh, ACO and Nike. But it, a lot of times it comes down to uh, timing and trust. Um, timing being right place, right time, right leader that buys off and really believes in design. At ACO it was Tim Parsi. Um, you know, at Nike was my bosses there. And, and them trusting you to go for it and, uh, and, and take a chance. And you know, Tim was like coming into this stagnant old company called ACO, Fortune Brands. Uh, swing line is like I need something insightful and disruptive and uh, like give me a value-added show car that you know can actually disrupt the category in the uh, industry so 
And, um, you know, when I left, actually, after two and a half years, it was actually deemed a failure, everything we'd done there. But then a couple years later, it accounted for a huge percentage of their sales. So it usually takes a little while, and I think it kind of uh, inspired, uh, it transcended the industry and kind of uh, inspired that commodity products can be well-designed as well. And I think we can re <laughs> relate to that, right? And it doesn't take much. It doesn't cost much more. I mean, one of my big, biggest successes there was a 65-cent stapler cost of goods, right? And it sold for 10 years. Um, you know, this was another one where my boss at Nike was like, everybody was sh taking a women's or uh, men's watch, shrinking it down, color coloring it pink and calling it a women's watch. And I was like, ah, I think there's something more to that with the material and something that was more delicate, but also had this duality from sport to going out. And I, so I went under the radar uh, against everybody else's opinion. And he was like, just do what you think is right and apologize later. And, um, you know, it came out. It, they, they forecasted 40,000 units and sold millions. And, and, and to the fact where, like, Nordstrom's, when Nike was trying to, Nike just has ADD2, they were always on to the next thing. And, like, they kept trying to kill that product. Nordstrom's like, you kill that product, we drop your whole line. So it just sold. It was autopilot. Um, but the, another thing at Nike that really kind of matured in me was the last three years I worked for Mark Parker, which was, like, a dream job. Um, it was before he was CEO, right before... Um, Bill Perez got ousted and uh, Mark took over. Um, and it was like connecting the dots. And uh, just, I was charged, with me and a small group, very small group was char were charged with um, looking for new business opportunities, new partnerships and new technologies for the Nike brands. And we had things like, you know, a white shoe with Nike ID is very intimidating for a consumer. Um, and we had a $200 million business um, based on that customization. But if you could, obviously if you, you could do something as small as change the button, what the button said, and you could change the conversion rate from 2% to 3%, and it's another incremental $100, uh, $100 million. So it's amazing how design and experience and confidence inf influences business. And um, we were also saying, well, if you, everybody's intimidated with white shoe, let's start with what you know LeBron would start with, and then tweaking it to make your own, that had a huge conversion as well. Um, so these kind of experiential insights were very important, and there was, there was a you know, a combination of business uh, experience and technology that really had to come together and be balanced. Um, uh, this was kind of a funny thing, which Wired Magazine asked me to kind of look at what device singularity and mobile would look like in 10 years, in the years 2014. And I had a Razor at this time, I think, or maybe it was a, before the Razor, a Samsung a flip phone of some sort. So we just looked at emerging technologies, projected it out 10, year, uh, 10 years, took two weeks, visualized all this, did a little film with Joe Kaczynski, who actually directed uh, Tron and, uh, and, um, um, and um, Oblivion, actually, right when he got out of Stanford. Um, incredible career tra trajectory. Um, but we just looked at it like, okay, what is it? And this was like athlete's eye. But you know, it's like you got a full touch phone, you had a smartwatch, and you had Google Glasses. And a, and airplay in there as well, which is pretty interesting that a sport company that was deemed that I was, they actually deemed that I was wasting my time because we're not a digital company at that point, um, didn't really condone that exercise. But, you know, years later, they're, they're obviously uh, in the game of digital and have dedicated a big, uh, a big investment into that. Um, we were actually working with PlayStation, Logitech, and... Um, uh, and Prime Sense out of uh, Israel on a uh, three camera system uh, that really physically mapped you for physical gaming, and we're calling it Game Fuel. And actually, Logitech had, was working with us on the little pod that went on your shoe uh, as well, for, so the kids would go outside and they could amp themselves up uh, playing basketball, running around. So when they came back in, they might be able to defeat somebody that, in the game that was actually better than them because they had amped up their character. So we were looking at like scenarios like that, you know, 2004. Um, Another thing, you know, I think, you know, talk is cheap. Actually, it's very, very expensive sitting around talking a lot and not doing. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, I see even at Nike, which is a very visual company, it's very design centric. In the end of the day, you just got to do it. And, you know, the, that's why their logo, you know, their slogan is not just, it's not just talk about it. It's like, just do it. So, um, you know, I, as a designer, like design thinking is, you know, obviously, um, you know, Tim Brown and IDEO and everybody is very um, popularized design thinking. And, you know, it is a business experience and technology. It's finding the user, you know, the business viability, the uh, technology feasibility and the user need. Right. And you've got to connect all those at the right time. Um, and I think, uh, you know, Nike really kind of taught me how to see that as well as my time at IDEO. And, um, 
it's a, it's a critical kind of component that a lot of businesses miss, miss because they force technology into a, a solution that uh, isn't needed. Um, inside out partnerships, um, this is kind of like some of the best work we've done is actually where we had a design Sherpa or a design champion or that inside entrepreneur inside working with us. Definitely happened on Xbox and Xbox Connect. Fun, funny that we were connected up again with PrimeSense uh, a decade later almost. Um, but this was a huge gamble on Microsoft and Microsoft makes some questionable gambles and questionable killings and uh, but they bet the farm on this one and it really paid off um, as far as uh, the physical gaming and getting people off the couch and actually in, in the one-to-one -one relationship is just amazing and I think it's really exciting to see where they'll go with this and what other companies will do. Uh, but we had a, we had a, uh, a guy inside, a couple guys inside that were just like the, the guys that fought the fight every day to make sure that it came out the way it did. And um, without them, that would never come out uh, like it did. And uh, I think, you know, I think you always need our best relationships and best work is always with somebody on the inside that's fighting for it. And of course, you know, this was a, you know, we were a small, nimble team here. Um, this was like Jay Allard and Albert Shum, who runs uh, Windows Mobile. Like, Allard got his Kindle and was like, what can we do for a tablet? And this was pre-iPad, so we came up, up with this kind of dual panel product, productivity tool called Courier, which was really about productivity and creation and co-creation and not so much about consumption, which iPad was when it came out. Um, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, small and nimble is good in the beginning, but you need to kind of get the stakeholders on board uh, early on. I uh, also found that at Nike. Like, we, Nike Explorer was a great group doing some amazing work before I got there, and it just wasn't being adopted by the inline businesses. So we started taking those. Um, we'd identify homes ahead of time, and then we'd take, pluck those people out of those businesses, take them out on the road, do immersive ethnographic research, get them on board so they felt like they were part of the team, and then we had a lot better traction going forward. So we did that kind of with uh, Courier, and it became a re 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 uh, almost a religion within uh, Microsoft. Um, but in the end, if you don't get the right guys on board, it, it, and, and you know, you're breaking some of the rules. I mean, breaking the rules is usually good, but if you break the rule of not getting buy-in from the top down, a lot of bad things happen. So um, you know, this was, uh, unfortunately, one of the biggest heartbreaks in my career when uh, Balmer killed this, mainly because Stanofsky uh, uh, just didn't believe this was where Windows was going. And we were trying to create a UI-less kind of uh, interface. Uh, and Windows saw it as a territorial um, problem. So, um, and hopefully this has influenced Surface to this uh, at this point as well. But it was a it was a great uh, it, when it got leaked. I think Jay Allard actually my <laughs> my guess is Jay actually leaked it because he felt a, a political killing coming, and and it got incredible press on uh, and um, uh, kudos on uh, Gizmodo and all the tech blogs. So um, in the end, it it wasn't right, and Jay left, and so did. Uh, uh, everybody else, Ray Ozzie. Um, this was uh, one of the first projects as I left uh, and when I started Minimal. Um, Bob Arco, an ex-IDEO guy as well, um, he uh, called and said, hey, I want to take a look at you know, the conference uh, setting and how do we change the conference center to be more collaborative and more conversational. And it really came down to, it was started off as a chair and a table, turned into three chairs and 50-some tables. And it was really just trying to make it, open up the proportions, make it you, um, be able to shift around, not use all the mechanisms that you typically like eject and lay back in these long global meetings anyways where teams come in from all over the place. The, um, and it, it ended up being nice and we always say the next position is the best position so it's all people can you know adjust their posture and uh, uh, it's more lounge. And it's amazing like if you, if you lower something five to six inches how much more conversational people get. Um, we always had these off-sites at Wyden and Kennedy when we were at Nike, which is a great firm, and we would uh, struggle with the problem all day. And why was it we'd come up with a uh, solution when we went down to the bar blue hour and uh, sat around the lounge after the, after the all-day brainstorm? So it could have been the alcohol, but it could also be just to be in a more rela uh, relaxed position. But this, this system allows a lot of different configurations. You can pull the technology to you, push it back. They don't have casters. It's more of a laid-back. Uh, kind of, it's not a lean-in kind of work, it's more of a laid-back uh, type of work. Um, but, you know, Bob was actually really good at, you know, navigating the kind of um, uh, the corporate kind of uh, construct as well to make sure this, in the, uh, and the gauntlet to make sure this came out. Um, and there was a small brand, Coles was a sub-brand of um, Steelcase. 
Other projects, you know, they're all about, we engineered the light, actually Chris Watson somewhere in here. Uh, there's Chris. Um, so we hired Chris from um, a lighting company and, you know, we had this table lamp. Uh, actually, uh, Artemi was looking for the replacement for the Telemeo, which is a tall order. Um, in the end of the day, we we're like, well, what do we want? We want something that's uh, um, between a table lamp and a desk lamp. And we ended up engineering a, a, a light guy, um, a light engine that essentially uses light guide technology, 3M, brightness enhancing film, and a stack that came here that was like, pretty impressively bright and uniform. And unfortunately, the engineering in Italy wanted to use a, you know, a inline LED and it was much thicker, less efficient, more expensive. And it's like, it's supposed to be coming out for the last two years. I think Chris and I could have shipped this two Christmases ago on our own. Um, unfortunately, you know, but it is a prestigious brand. We'll see what happens. So those types of things also push you to do your own thing a little bit more than, uh, um, than you, uh, they just push you <laughs> in a way for the gratification. Um, I already talked about the balancing of business experience and technology, which I think is very important um, in all those kind of uh, engagements. Joint ventures, you know, this is something we tend to do with uh, startups. Um, uh, this is a, a, a west suburb guy that was in water um, treatment and disinfection and came in, wanted a solution for hospital rooms to fight MRSA and C. diff. Uh, which we know is killing more people than leading to can uh, cancers right now. Um, Father-in-law got one. You know, it's like, it's amazing, like how many people you know that has got have a MRSA infection or a C. diff. Um, the, uh, this is using UV light. Uh, we kind of designed the whole thing, designed it, the experience, the engineering. Actually, we're working on the fabrication, uh, early um, a low production run as well. Um, did the app on the Android, and essentially what happens is you go into a room, you put these three towers, they triangulate, they, uh, with a laser range finder, they assess the distance to all the surfaces in the room and around the um, uh, patient uh, bed, uh, which calculates the exposure time. You go outside, you uh, bombard the room, and it kills the bugs at a cellular level. So, and then the three towers allows you to eliminate shadows. So, um, and we created a lot of the IP for these guys as well. So, um, you know, obviously a meaningful Thing. It's not the most glamorous thing in the world, but uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, solving a problem. And this is, you know, the problem that most of these surfaces are left uncleaned. Um, and there was another project that came in that was, you know, uh, a woman, Marie, uh, out of Stanford, um, had lost her husband at 41 and from a sudden heart attack. And uh, she had an algorithm and a stethoscope that essentially, she was doing a 3M Lippmann stethoscope, actually, and her husband, and she'd been using her husband at night, to gather sound files of his heart. And uh, when he died, you know, when she recovered from the shock of it all being Marie, she was like having to figure out why. And if he wasn't normal, what was, she went and identified what normal was, came back, reverse engineered an algorithm that essentially identifies turbulence in the heart. She came in with a stethoscope and an algorithm and she wanted to create a product and other firms had kind of uh, turned her down, didn't have time or weren't interested or couldn't take the risk. Um, actually, Mark, uh, Mark over at IDEO referred her over to me, and my mom had actually passed away at 51 from a sudden heart attack, so it was kind of a close to home type of a problem and um, um, issue, so I definitely felt like I had to help her. So it's a, you know, like I said, it's a fast, non-invasive, radiation-free test that essentially goes on top of the, uh, top of the chest over the four arteries and um, can quantifiably tell you whether or not you have any kind of blockage. Um, her for one of her first three seed investors, one was overweight, one was overweight and hypertensive, and the third one was a 50 year old one, uh, 51 year old uh, triathlete, great shape. He tested 80% positive for a blockage in his widow maker. Um, went in echocardiogram, stress test, you know, you're fine. He went, his cardiologist said, you got the, you got the pass. And then he went out to go golfing in Palm Springs, had tightness in the chest, went in for a CT scan and had a 80% blockage that we said was there. So. Originally, we thought was screwed, but then it turned out to be great. And she actually, she just, uh, it was a week or two ago, she saved somebody else in the trials, FDA trials. Um, you know, the stats are pretty staggering. Like, actually, uh, you know, 935,000 heart attacks per year, um, 600,000 deaths, and that's the big one. 66% have no prior history or indication. So, um, you know, her goal is to eliminate needless death. Um, actually, in... Yeah, it was funny, I and mean, then Apple's perfectly okay with me saying that too, because they want us to make it through. They, they were very interested in acquiring this uh, technology. So, but Marie didn't want to leave <laughs> Minneapolis for some reason and move to Cupertino, but uh, who knows. <laughs>
But I think in the end, she wants to save lives at the clinical level, at the cardiologist level, and not at the consumer uh, product level. Um, you know, brand incubation, so how am I doing on time? I'm out? Almost done. So, Rook, I'm not even going to get to it. So, here's the baby furniture uh, company. Um, ended up licensing that off. The uh, Uncommon, the customization, on demand, so one off mass customization. And then when I kind of lost that company, I felt pretty bad. And uh, <laughs> you feel like this a lot when you're doing these startups. <laughs> How many times did I look like this this winter? <laughs> so I had a lot of time on my hands after like spending a lot of time on that startup. So I had this idea and I showed my wife and she was like, well, that's stupid. It was uh, an idea to turn a, a nano into a watch. And I was like, oh, I should, I'm going to kickstart this thing on this art, art platform that raises money. And she's like, oh, you know, it looks like people raising $5,000 here, $2,500 there. I'm like, OK. So I ended up uh, putting it on there. And I think a lot most people know the story there. We raised a million dollars in, uh, in uh, 30 days. Um, I was going to show you a brand video. I don't know. How much time do I actually have? Three minutes? Hmm. Well, three minutes done, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm not going to show the video. You can see it online. So we did it three times. The brand's cool. It's in Chicago. It's foggy. Um, <laughs> you know, we like creating beautiful bridges between connections that we see out there that need to be connected. And uh, I think there was uh, a couple things in here I wanted to show. Like we have a huge um, following, and we like to activate her. And this is like a design thinking problem. Like we hear people always selling our products word of mouth. Uh, like I sold 20 on the train or the bar this week. So we created an app that allows you to, like our fans to sell, our customers to sell to other customers. So they get, um, somebody stops you for your watch or your phone. Um, you pull out your app, you show them uh, the different products, you send them, the, uh, send them an email or a, um, uh, a message and then if they use that link to buy, they get a 20% uh, discount, you get a 20% cash commission. So we've, we've rolled it out in beta, we've sold about $250,000 worth of thing, we've, we've probably sold about uh, commission, we've fulfilled about 25,000 com uh, in commission. There's a, a couple of guys like Clinton, he's a military guy, we sent him a check for $700,000 a month. Uh, we're going to white label this into other brands as well. Um, and uh, let's see if I can. Big difference between a, creating a prototype business on, uh, on a Kickstarter versus a sustainable, profit, profitable one. You know, Kickstarter is great to a certain point, but all that is you're left on your own. Um, this is interesting. I just got an email probably an hour before I left to come up here that the Homeland Security had seized uh, $2.3 million worth of counterfeit lunatic products uh, down in Champaign, Illinois. Which is incredible. I mean, I, what he sold, I mean, that was, that was what he had. I don't know how much he sold already. Um, and, uh, you know, I, another piece of advice, find people that are uh, good at what you don't want to do. And uh, here's a pie chart of, like, where all the money went in the mil million dollars. It's like, it's not as much as you think when you're done. The cost of goods, legal, startup misc, you know, you end up having less money to buy the next 10,000 units than you needed, and you have to take a loan. So it's uh, not quite. <laughs> and here's another a really important thing is like, you know, 5,000 backers on uh, Kickstarter is a home run, uh, but it's really in reality only uh, equal to like one PO from one retail customer uh, for one month in reality. And, and that's where a lot of these Kickstarter companies come out. They finally fulfill, and then somebody else has taken their idea and run, uh, run away with it. So um, we're scaling now. We, we, we're, we've been a... Uh, a 70% direct consumer, direct to consumer business. This year we're going to Apple, Best Buy. I have a deal with uh, Best Buy now. And you know, what's staggering is that our online business is uh, the same size as brands that are 20 times our size, like in case. So this year is a lot of growth. And you know, I think we just uh, need to add fuel now and we're raising money and trying to decide which way we, which way we wanna go. Um, I think I can end there. Uh, I'm way over, I'm always over. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that was great. That was wonderful.